100 years ago, an extraordinary man passed away in the Holy Land at the age of 77. He had spent more than half a century as a prisoner and an exile. But on his release, and despite his advanced age, his health impaired by decades of imprisonment, he set off on a journey to spread a message of peace, unity, and hope to the world. His name was Abdul Baha. I could see the radiance of this man who was to make such an impression on all our lives. You see such power latent within that person. I never in all my life heard a voice like that. It was vibrant and ringing. I'm Rain Wilson. And I'm Parisa Fitzhenley. And in this series of podcasts, we'll be finding out about this unique figure in human history, celebrating his life and legacy and the enduring influence he has had on people around the world ever since. When he left the house, the sun disappeared, but that kind of sunshine never leaves one's heart. Through his public talks, his writings, his love and service to all who crossed his path, Abdul Baha offered a pattern of right living to all people for all time. He was, in every sense of the word, an ambassador to humanity. When someone important or very much loved passes away, you would expect there to be a large crowd at the funeral. But imagine the scene on the 28th of November 1921, when not hundreds or thousands, but tens of thousands of people line the streets of the Mediterranean port city of Haifa in what is now Israel for a funeral unlike any other. You'd expect a crowd like that for a king, perhaps, or a president or a global celebrity. But Abdul Baha was something different altogether. For most of his 77 years, he had been a prisoner and an exile, banished from his homeland of Iran at the age of nine and finally released at the age of 64. Yet on the day after his passing, throngs of people of all ages from many diverse races and religions swarm around his coffin as the funeral procession winds its way slowly up to the site chosen for his resting place. John Bosch, an American attending the funeral, describes the scene. There were men of all nations, of all creeds, of all walks of life, high and low, rich and poor. It seemed that never had there been such a funeral procession before. So great was the desire to help carry the casket up the mountain that some of the men were wrangling for the privilege of only touching it with their fingertips. For an hour and a half, that great mass of people slowly moved along the winding road up the steep incline of Mount Carmel. Also among the crowd is Sir George Stuart Symes, the British governor of the Northern District of Palestine. He is one of the many mourners to pay tribute to Abdul Baha. Most of us here have a clear picture of Sir Abdul Baha Abbas, of his dignified figure walking thoughtfully in our streets, of his courtesy and gracious manner, of his kindness, of his love for the little children and for the flowers, and of his generosity and care for the poor and suffering. So gentle was he, and so simple, that in his presence one almost forgot that he was also a great teacher, and that his writings and his conversations have been a solace and an inspiration to hundreds and thousands of people in the East and West. So who is this great man, and why is there such an outpouring of grief at his passing? Why are the followers of so many different religions and from so many cultures and communities attending his funeral? And today, when we face such painfully complex and earth-convulsing issues, what insights can we gain from Abdul Baha's life, his view of reality, and the things he said and wrote? How can they help us address the most pressing challenges of our own time? Most people, however celebrated they're destined to become, are born in obscurity, unknown to the rest of the world. Abdul Baha is born into a noble family in Tehran, the capital of Iran, in May 1844. 
Originally named Abbas after his grandfather, he will display from the earliest age a remarkable self-sacrificing nature, giving up whatever he has to his brothers and sisters, keeping nothing for himself. He is always gentle, he never becomes angry, never retaliates. The birth of Abdu'l-Bahá, though, happens on the very same day as a world-shaking event a thousand kilometers to the south of Tehran in the city of Shiraz. Here, a young man known as the Bab, meaning gate, proclaims himself as the herald to an eagerly awaited new era in human history. The Bab announces that a divinely inspired messenger will soon bring the teachings the world needs to establish peace, unity, and justice. Soon afterwards, among the first to follow the Bab is Abdul Baha's father, Baha'u'llah. Sadly, as always happens when a new divine message is brought to the world, there's a violent backlash by those in authority who feel threatened. Over the next six years, as the Bab's message spreads like wildfire throughout Iran, violent persecutions break out. The Bab is publicly executed in July 1850. Tens of thousands of his followers are brutally killed. Baha'u'llah is incarcerated for four months in a dark underground dungeon, leaving his family vulnerable and terrified about what might happen next. Swept up in the storm, the eight-year-old Abdul Baha finds himself one day surrounded by a threatening gang of boys. As his sister Bahia later describes, He was standing in their midst as straight as an arrow, a little fellow, the youngest and smallest of the group, firmly but quietly commanding them not to lay their hands upon him, which, strange to say, they seemed unable to do. After that, my mother thought it unsafe to leave him at home knowing his fearless disposition, and that when he went into the street, as he usually did, to watch for her coming, eagerly expectant of news from his father, for whom even at that early age he had a passionate attachment, he would be beset and tormented by the boys. So, she took him with her, leaving me at home with my younger brother. During these dark days, Baha'u'llah has an extraordinary experience in the underground dungeon. He describes that he feels that his soul is filled with the Spirit of God, revealing to him that he is the Promised One heralded by the Bab. Throughout the ages, God has sent divine messengers known as Manifestations of God. Among them, Abraham, Krishna, Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus Christ, and Muhammad. All of them are teachers from the one same God. All of their teachings have released a new infusion of power into the world that cultivates humanity's spiritual, intellectual, and moral capacities. Baha'u'llah realizes that he is the latest of these divinely inspired educators. For the next 40 years, thousands of verses containing spiritual inspiration and practical guidance for humanity will flow through Baha'u'llah's pen. For the time being, though, he will not make this overwhelming revelation known to anyone. But his young son, Abdul Baha, recognizes that something has changed in his father, and he becomes even more devoted to him. In December 1852, Baha'u'llah is released from the dungeon and banished from Iran, never to see his native land again. The winter trek across the border into Iraq, under military escort, is especially arduous for his children. 
The journey lasted a month. We were all insufficiently clothed and suffered keenly from exposure. My brother in particular was very thinly clad, riding upon a horse, his feet, ankles, hands, and wrists were much exposed to the cold, which was so severe that they became frostbitten and swollen and caused him great pain. Barely settled in Baghdad, the young Abdu'l-Bahá is again separated from Baha'u'lláh, who, like the great prophets of God before him, withdraws into the wilderness. He goes to the mountains of Sulaymaniyya to pray and meditate, and to prepare himself for his mission. Baha'u'lláh's whereabouts are unknown for two years, and his absence has a devastating effect on his son. He would go away by himself, and when sought for, be found weeping, often falling into such paroxysms of grief that no one could console him. The childhood and youth of my brother was in fact, in all respects, unusual. He did not care for play or for amusement like other children. He would not go to school, nor would he apply himself to study. Yet despite this, even at such a young age, Abdu'l-Bahá demonstrates an extraordinary wisdom and eloquence. He is able to speak about the universal and progressive ideas of the Bab and Baha'u'lláh, impressing people of all ages and from all walks of life who hear him. When Baha'u'lláh finally returns in 1856, Abdu'l-Bahá, now 12 years old, is overwhelmed with joy. Without revealing to anyone the nature of the revelation he has experienced, Baha'u'llah, nevertheless, begins to give vision and hope to the dispirited followers of the Bab and mixes freely with the people of Baghdad, enlightening them about the fundamental oneness of religion and the essential unity of all humanity. And those who seek out Baha'u'llah over the next seven years have nothing but praise and admiration for the quality of character of his eldest son, Abdu'l-Bahá. But, as Baha'u'llah's fame begins to spread further afield, the authorities, fearing his growing influence, decide to move the family on again to the Ottoman capital of Constantinople. Before leaving Baghdad, however, Baha'u'llah reveals his mission to his family and followers for the first time. In a beautiful garden called Rezvan, meaning paradise, beside the Tigris River, Baha'u'llah declares himself to be God's latest messenger foretold in all of the world's scriptures. He says, This is the day in which mankind can behold the face and hear the voice of the promised one. The breezes of the all-glorious were wafted over me and taught me the knowledge of all that hath been. This thing is not from me, but from one who is almighty and all-knowing. Abdu'l-Bahá fully recognizes his father's incredible station. By now 19 years old, Abdu'l-Bahá is handsome and gracious, zealous to serve and generous to all. But his concern is to make the toil of the coming journey of banishment less arduous for Baha'u'lláh and his companions. Leslie Teherzadeh Omara is a writer who has studied the lives of Baha'u'lláh and Abdu'l-Bahá. The relationship between Baha'u'lláh and Abdu'l-Bahá is just so precious and so tender and so beautiful. Abdu'l-Bahá, having recognized Baha'u'lláh, having that love for him and that will to serve him, then he did everything he could to ensure the best possibility of any comfort 
for Baha'u'llah on those journeys and how he would go ahead and suss out the village they were arriving in, find people who could assist, take friends with him to start making arrangements for the arrival of Baha'u'llah and just seeing to everything. For the next five years, throughout an arduous exile and leading up to a final banishment to the Ottoman prison city of Akka in 1868, Abdu'l-Bahá increasingly serves his father as secretary and representative, chief of the household, and devoted shield. His sister Bahia remembers. He had from childhood a remarkably self-sacrificing nature, habitually yielding his own wishes and giving up whatever he had to his brothers and sisters, keeping nothing for himself. The life we were living afforded constantly recurring occasions for the exhibition of these qualities of his character. And his unceasing efforts did a great deal to make its conditions endurable for the other members of the family. For the poor, also, he had ever been very tender-hearted and destitute as we were, he always contrived to find something to give to the others who were in greater want. Abdu'l-Bahá is 24 when the exiles finally set foot ashore at Akka on the 31st of August, 1868, to be imprisoned in its harsh fortress. At that time, there was no landing for the city. It was necessary to wade ashore from the boats. The governor ordered that the women be carried on the backs of the men. My brother was not willing that this should be done and protested against it. He was one of the first to land and procure the chair in which, with the help of one of the believers, he carried the women ashore. In the intense dry heat of summer, the community of exiles are now crammed into a few bare cells, denied food and water and any comfort, distraught at what will become of them. It is Abdu'l-Bahá who arises without a thought for himself to attend to their needs. Under these conditions, my brother spent the first part of the night in passing about among the distressed people, trying to pacify them, and in appealing to the soldiers not to be so heartless as to allow women and children to suffer so. About midnight, he succeeded in getting a message to the governor. We were then sent a little water and some cooked rice. Abdu'l-Bahá takes personal responsibility for the care of the prisoners, a characteristic that in the months and years to come extends to the whole population of Akka and becomes a daily defining feature for the rest of his life in the Holy Land. Taking no rest for himself, he watches over Baha'u'llah, all of his family, friends, and neighbors, assists those who require care, nurses those who have fallen sick, and feeds those who are hungry. From his arrival in Akka and for the next 24 years until the passing of Baha'u'llah in 1892, Abdu'l-Bahá continues to shield and serve his father and his companions, now known as Baha'is or followers of Baha'u'llah. Beyond them, he brings solace and comfort to all the people of the prison city, and, without ever compromising his principles, he wins the affection and esteem of callous jailers, brutal guards, and hostile officials. In time, although he remains a prisoner, Abdu'l-Bahá's role and authority gradually grow alongside his social relations with the Ottoman authorities and prominent figures. His generosity of spirit and selfless service endears him to all. Australian journalist Michael Day has studied Abdu'l-Bahá's life in the Holy Land. 
He was a fit, strong man. He had black hair and a black beard and blue-gray eyes. He was a swimmer. He was an expert horseman. He was a person who was confident and skilled in so many areas. He was a person who could give advice to farmers on how to grow and store their crops. He was an authority on religious history. He could quote from the Bible. He knew the Quran backwards. They saw him more as a saint, as a holy person who was very inspiring, but also very practical in the way that he could give practical solutions to problems. And he wasn't one who just associated with the leaders of the society or the leaders of the various religious communities. People who got up early, they would have seen him at dawn or before dawn leaving his house. He would go in the mornings. He would walk to the poorer parts of the city, usually by himself, but he would give away clothes. He would give away coins or food or medicine and listen to them. It has to be remembered that there was no social security or help for a lot of people in those days. Some of them were desperately poor and sometimes he would come back, his hands would be bleeding from people grabbing him to try and get some of the blankets or food or clothing that he was dispensing. And this was a regular habit of his. He knew people from all levels of society, which was quite astounding in those days. For the remaining years of his life, through a growing body of writings, Baha'u'llah expounds on the idea that all humanity are one family, equal in the sight of God, transcending all divisions of race, nation, gender, and social class. He teaches humanity that they are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Deal ye one another with the utmost love and harmony, he writes, with friendliness and fellowship. Baha'u'llah says we should regard man as a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. Education can alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit therefrom. No one is more exemplary in living fully the teachings of Baha'u'llah than his eldest son, Abdul Baha. In his interactions with the people of Akka and increasingly further afield, Abdul Baha educates everyone he meets through his words and his personal qualities. Leslie Taherzadeh Omara says that at this point it becomes clear that Abdul Baha is the perfect example of the pattern of living that his father is prescribing for all humanity. His life is absolutely coherent with the revelation of Baha'u'llah. His thoughts, his words, his discourse, his actions, his service, everything is absolutely coherent. And so this is why he is our exemplar. It's not that Abdul Baha is standing there and saying, this is the way you have to behave. And so he behaves that way. He is that way of behaving. As the 20th century dawns, Abdul Baha's fame will spread beyond the walls of the prison city of Akka, and his extraordinary qualities will increasingly be seen as a model for all people. Here we have a human who's not even been to school ever in his life. Distinguished Baha'i speaker, artist, and writer Hooper Dunbar and yet is so lucid and informed on everything, and the essence of courtesy, the highest quality of the science of sociability with everyone he met, that's a marvelous example to have left in the world. In Abdul Baha, we have the closest we can get to a perfect human being. And you see this reflected in his talks and in his interaction with people, in his attendance to peace conferences, in addressing the problem of racism and the equality of women with respect particularly to the vote. This example is going to last for centuries. In the next podcast, we will discover how the first Americans and Europeans come to visit Abdul Baha in Akka and how their lives begin to be changed by his example.